School celebrates United Nations Day. Civil and Identity Registry opens WIWAC office. And Central Dabari officially bid for 2019 NRL competition. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is Wednesday's news. Today marks 73 years of the United Nations' work in advocating peace and good order in the world. To commemorate UN Day in PNG, students from PNG Paradise High School participated in a mock United Nations General Assembly and exhibition. UN Resident Coordinator Gianluca Rampola said the United Nations was happy to work with the PNG government over the last 40 years. To celebrate the United Nations Day, students from Paradise High School took part in celebrations representing 14 UN member countries in a face and so. An exhibition was also held where students explained what they knew about the different UN member countries, including PNG. Um, we have uh, around 860 indigenous languages spoken in Papua New Guinea. Pidgin is um, the language which is spoken widely around PNG. Um, English uh, spoken by 1 to 2 percent of the population, and Hiri Motu spoken less than, by less than 2 percent. Um, the dressing for an average Papua New Guinean for the ladies it's Mary Blowers and a lap lap. For the boys it's a um, collar button and a lap lap. But Nowadays, because of the Western influence, um, some of the dressing has changed now, like now. Students also took part in a mock General Assembly meeting. United Nations Residence Coordinator Gianluca Rampola was happy to witness the students celebrating UN Day. Mr. Rampola also emphasizing UN's role in partnering with the government to advocate peace and social development. And, uh, and what we all stand for are values that are very much on the by Papua New Guinea itself, you know, the right to inclusiveness, human rights, the right to being free from, from fear and need, uh, the importance of inclusive development, the importance of respect for human rights, the importance of peace. And so today is just a day for all of us to remind ourselves what those values are. And, uh, and I'm so happy to see all of these uh, young people actually making the United Nations theirs, because that's what it is. The role of the UN in PNG is broad and covers many aspects including campaigns against gender-based violence and other pressing issues. Issues which Mr. Rampola said were critical to improving the lives of Papua New Guineans. We're working on, uh, on behavioral change to ensure a reduction on the impact of gender-based violence in Port Mosby and in many other cities and out in the countryside. So there are a number of different areas that we work extensively with government, with civil society, uh, with the private sector. And uh, we are proud to have been able to be here for 40 years and to have the trust of the government of the people of, of PNG to be truly partners in all of this. Rayon Lakingu, National MTV News. The Papua New Guinea Cancer Foundation helps in bringing across awareness to the public on the reality of cancer in the country. It is quite alarming and often people do not really know that they have it until it reaches the final stages where even radiotherapy cannot save a patient. What is more alarming is that Papua New Guinea lacks facilities and adequate drugs to help cancer patients who often die a painful death. Prevention, screening and early detection. Those are the measures to counter the spread of breast and cervical cancer among women and cancer in general. But it's easier said than done. Cancer has become a lifestyle disease associated with unhealthy food choices and addiction to alcohol and cigarettes. The sad reality also is the access to screening facilities to detect early symptoms. And for further treatment, the misery continues. In Papua New Guinea, with the only cancer ward in the country in Lays Engau Hospital not operational. Apart from diagnostic facilities and cancer centers, we have the National Cancer Unit in Engau. At the moment, it's not fully functional because of the cobalt unit. So that's the machine that provides radiotherapy to treat cancer. 
there are issues with having that replaced. So that has an impact on the treatment of cancer. The Cancer Foundation established in 2014 is aimed at providing awareness and education to help the public understand the steps of prevention, screening and early detection. The statistics are alarming. Cervical cancer is the biggest killer, with an estimated 700 women dying each year. That is two women dying each day of the year. 9% of bed admissions in hospitals are occupied by women with cancer, and one in six deaths in hospitals are cancer-related. So they travel out to um, provinces, deliver um, educational materials. They've, since its inception, we have reached over 6,000 um, participants. We now have the Healthy Teens um, program because we believe that it's important to get these positive messages out early to children. Dr. Linda Sirigoy, the chairperson of the Cancer Foundation, says it is very expensive to treat cancer, often the most obvious solution being to travel overseas for treatment. The foundation does its best by what little they have and spread awareness through places where they can, teaching the community, hoping they pass the message of prevention, screening and early detection. So our data shows that most of the um, workshops that the foundation goes out to, at least 70% of the participants don't know what cancer is or have ever heard of you know, cervical cancer and that. So we say out in the rural, but there's still a lot of people, even in, in urban centres, even professionals, even working people, who don't really understand what cancer is. The lunch hosted today saw the foundation raise almost 70,000 kina, with 20 companies joining in the Pink Ribbon campaign to support the prevention of cancer among women. Fidelis Sukina, National MTV News. The Papua New Guinea Defence Force today received ammunition from the Indonesian National Military as part of their support for APEC. The ammunition will be used by the Defence Forces Ceremonial Company when they provide the Guard of Honour in welcoming 21 world leaders in Port Mosby next month. Indonesian Ambassador to PNG Ronald Manik said their support will help strengthen the relationship between the governments of Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. Today, an Indonesian military aircraft arrived at the PNG DF Air Transport Wing, transporting boxes of ammunition to be used by the PNG DF during APEC. Also on board were military officers from the Indonesian National Military who will provide training and assistance to the PNZDF. According to Indonesian Ambassador Ronald P.J. Manik, Indonesia fully supports PNZ in providing capacity building projects and training in its preparation for APEC. As you are aware, the government of Indonesia from the very beginning committed to supporting the PNG government in hosting the APEC 2018 as it was re reflected in the meeting in Bali in 2013. To that end, Indonesia actually has provided some assistance in the forms of capacity building program. This donated ammunition will also see members of the Indonesian military participate in training with the PNGDF in the lead-up to APEC. PNGDF Chief of Staff Captain Philip Polewara thanked the government of Indonesia for the support, saying this support will go a long way in strengthening the relationship between the two countries. And again, the crews that will go through with us for the training, I you know, convey again our thank you that... Though we had some training in the past, but it is our request that we just want to be that extra confidence that the guns that were never used for that period that was lying silent, that your uh, subject matter experts uh, give us the confidence and approve that they are good to work, good to operate in all conditions as we go into APEC with confidence to operate them. A memorandum of agreement to begin the training program was also signed, which will see the Indonesian soldiers that arrived today remain in PNZ until their training is completed. Rayon Lakingu, National MTV News. Minister for Trade, Commerce and Industry, Wera Mori, says the landowner group petitioning the government over water supply to Port Mosby is not recognized by the government. 
With calls to shut down water supply before APEC, Minister Worry said any action would be illegal and police will arrest any individuals. The issue stems from 20 million kina paid out from an approved 50 million kina as part of a sustainable and benefit sharing package allocated by the government. For the whole region here, I am now completed here. Please, we want Prime Minister to come and address us here in a polite manner. The one that we need. The Minister for Trade, Commerce and Industry is the chairman of the Ministerial Committee on Koyari Issue. Current Minister Wera Mori confirmed paying out 20 million kina to several incorporated landowner group. 10 million kina was paid to the upper Rana ILGs and 10 million to the lower Rana landowners. The payment of Lower Rona ILGs consisting of Narami Clan ILG, Omani Clan ILG and Behori Clan ILG was taken to court. The National Court ruled in favour of the three Lower Rona ILGs and so began the disagreement on whom the money should be paid to. Today, Minister Mori stood by the three ILGs of Lower Rona based on the court ruling. That the provocation of such threats amounted by few individuals who are not the landowner ILG chairmen of the Koyari ILG group, landowning of all the Koyari ILG groups. But it happens that some of them may have, in, have gone into debts, a lot of debts that they cannot be able to pay their lawyers or the accountants or other service providers. And now using threat to get the attention to be paid, knowingly that some or more money may be paid in due course to Koyari landowners. Minister Mori says any disruptions to water and electricity during APEC will result in arrest being made. No one in his or a rightful frame of mind should derail nor embarrass Papua New Guinea now that we are moving towards APEC. So I'd like to call upon those so-called query landowners that they must know that some of them had already signed indemnity agreements identifying themselves that they will not be involved in such activities in the future. And if they do, they will be dealt with. Meanwhile, the chairman of NARMI, Omani and Behori ILG were present and reassured Port Moresby residents that no disruption of water or power supply would take place in their area of Lower Rana where the main water valve is located. Last time I put in this power law, pass it power Navara, or like a more passive law, then Rona Bond of Tachi. It's Rona Bamba forcing Bamba doing all right to government law, using force for local arresting Rona, looking behind the bar. Athlete Sirks Kari National, MTV News. Cocoa farming may not be an easy way to make a living in the Pomia district of East New Britain province, but more and more small farms are popping up. A combination of high freight costs, inaccessibility and unstable cocoa prices have rendered it a difficult crop to farm. But new steps taken by the district's administration have encouraged cocoa farmers not to lose hope. We've come to Ram Village in the Tokai Ward, located on the southern coastline from the district headquarters at Palmalmal. It's a small hamlet of about 500 men, women and children. At one end of the village, Chris Konkule is nursing a new generation of cocoa trees. It's a community initiative of a small church group, but it has now gained more members from the village. I take my initiative. A lot of time, I play it by organizing me play along. The small group is one of other similar groups that have surfaced in the district. The area used to be a logging region in the 1990s, but when the loggers left, most of the services that the village used to have scaled down. Since the logging company has moved on, the village has turned to cocoa as a means of earning an income. So, lo you know, I'm a permanent nursery bloomy plant. At the same time, I'm planting bad wood on the lo here. So from here now, I'm distributing me along all farmers' community now. 
Farming cocoa in this part of the district has been very difficult. High freight costs and unstable cocoa prices and lack of technical advice from cocoa experts have made cocoa a crop difficult to farm. But despite all the negativity, the villagers here have not given up. It's only achievable by mixing tomorrow holy man I may walk. Cocoa board is here to stay. Me by me finish tomorrow, but cocoa board will be here to stay. And me plan at all programs where it's tough. Time me plan establish him or cluster group like you plan you plan walking business. A few meters away from the village. A new piece of land has been cleared to make way for the construction of a new village cocoa nursery. Similar interest like this is happening in Palmalmal, where the large amount of oil palm developments are taking place. But not all the locals want to allow oil palm into their customary land. Over the weekend, the Cocoa Board of Papua New Guinea handed over nursery items following the signing of an MOA in February. The items will be used to establish new cocoa nurseries for cloned cocoa seedlings to be supplied to interested farming groups. I play a policy that every marriage family in Pomeo only must get at least 100 cocoa trees. The district's economy has grown over the past decade, prompted by oil palm growth. But while all eyes are now on the crop as the main revenue driver for the district, not everyone wants to grow it. Farmers like Chris and others want to grow cocoa instead. And with help from the district's administration and the presence of the cocoa board in the district, Chris and his fellow farmers hope to make a difference in their village life, slowly but surely. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. Early this morning, a semi-trailer carrying telecommunication cables overturned at Koki Market in Port Mosby after the crane of the trailer became wedged on the overhead crossing. The clearance height between the overhead crossing and the road is only four meters. MTV reporter Godwin Eki was at the scene and filed this report. Now, while this is not the first time for such incident to happen here under the overhead crossing, now residents here are calling on NCDC to either lift the overhead crossing an extra two meters higher or completely remove the crossing. Carrying close to 22 tons of telephone cables, a semi-trailer of logistical company Express Freight Management was en route from Motikea to its EFM office when it wedged its crane under the overhead crosswalk, causing the trailer to turn over. According to EFM, staff and the local residents of Koki, the overhead foot crossing, unlike the crossing at Vision City, that six meters high above ground, stands at only four meters high. Most uh, people remember, must look, look, look. This is a bridge. I'm all must happy. Like, like, yeah. I must plug on the car. I'm all look, look. Come here. All look, look. Rush him, rush him. Now all contractor work, look. Come maintain him, maintain him. Now this is a mean or way blogging. Most people remember, must look, look, good. Look, this is a so all can next anymore. This is a kind so. Now all blogging. I'm all can put one plus support because I'm not plug bridge go across in this road here now. He says with the ring road now in operation and roads connecting from Motukea into the city, trailers should try using the freeway to avoid local traffic. According to residents at Koki, while the overhead crossing is safe for pedestrians, people are not using the bridge as much as they should to avoid unexpected traffic accidents. Oh no, plenty of good now walking this la one mm because my step two I'm all suppose all walking leg leg. I'm all man can I'm almost na kala pun this la step na kam lo this la side ba. Step two I'm landing blow I'm all walking mo eye leg leg. That's why all man knows on us I use this la bridge come lo this la side. Both the driver and the passenger of the semi-trailer came out of the incident unharmed. Port Mosby currently has four overhead crossings located at Koki, Ohola, Vision City and Four Mile. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. 
The Australasian Law Reform Agency's conference today focused on cybercrime. Today's sessions began with legal developments in the e-commerce arena and internet and its governance. It continued with cybercrime and experiences of the digitized world and will end tomorrow with the state of the law in e-health and other thematic topics. The sessions will conclude tonight with the launching of the first legal dictionary written by an indigenous, indigenous Papua New Guinean in Dr. Eric Kwa, the Secretary of the Constitutional Law Reform Commission. You're with the National MTV News. We go for our first break, but stay tuned. We'll have more after these messages. Don't go away. Welcome back to the news. Five senior public servants signed their employment contracts today at Government House. Governor General Sebob Dadai was present to certify their contracts, each for a term of four years. Among those who signed the permanent contracts were Work Secretary David Wery and Dixon Guina as Secretary for the Department of Provincial Affairs and Local Level Government. The five senior public servants who were present this morning at Konidobu to confirm their appointments. All the employment contracts were from national executive decisions in late 2017 and early 2018. Work Secretary David Wera was the first to sign his contract. Acting for nearly more than two years, Dixon Guina was appointed another four years as Secretary for Provincial Affairs and Local Level Government. Present to witness all the appointments was DPM Secretary Tai Sanson. Apart from two departmental secretaries, Morobe and Gulf Provincial Administrators signed their contracts as well. Mark Orisuru for Gulf and Bart Ipambons for Morobe. Apart from that, Rao Samuel signed as insurance commissioner for a period of four years. The appointment of the department heads and senior public servants by the National Executive Council has been publicized in the National Gazette. Jack Lepava, Jr., National MTV News. This Friday will be treated as a normal working day for businesses in Medang and employees who stay at home to join the nationwide work boycott will be noted as absent from official duty. President of the Medang Chamber of Commerce, Kevin Murray, says business houses cannot afford to shut down for a full day and lose income from a day's operations. Mr. Murray explains the reason is also compounded by the current economic situation where businesses are struggling to stay afloat. President of Medang's Chamber of Commerce, Kevin Murray, says they understand where the opposition is coming from, and these are issues that need to be raised. However, the business houses believe that the call for a nationwide strike covering all businesses is an overreaction to the issues raised by the opposition. You know, these issues can be raised and discussed in, uh, in formal forums. As it is at present, the, this issue has only been raised in social media and the business houses feel that they cannot react to uh, situations which are discussed or, or posted on social media only. The business houses say they would comply if there is an official government instruction or regulation on the government's position on the boycott. Mr. Murray says the Chamber of Commerce is not encouraging nor discouraging any business houses to close or stay open, leaving the final decision to them. Employees taking the day off will be treated as being absent from work without leave. But as we have, as we have now, we've got the, this has only been brought up on social media and, uh, and if the business houses responded to everything that was brought up on social media, we'd be closed down all the time. <laughs> There's just too many issues that are raised on social media. Um, so the official position of the Chamber is that uh, we are advising our, business, our members, if they want to close down, that's their, that's their choice. If they want to stay open, we would encourage them to stay open. The opposition has called for a nationwide boycott by all workers to protest what they are describing as the systematic corruption crippling the country. Matha Lubis, National MTV News, Medang. 
Higher Education Minister and Mbongu MP Pilan Ningi is calling on the opposition to do check and balances in the latest APEC Maserati saga. In a statement, Minister Ningi described the opposition's planned nationwide stop work as a misuse of constitutional mandates. He urged members of the opposition to consult relevant authorities and register their complaints of the purchasing of the 40 Italian Maseratis, including other APEC expenses. The Higher Education Minister urged public servants to be responsible and attend to work. Mr Niningi affirmed the only label led government's commitment in delivering a successful 2018 APEC come November. ECPIC will now have its own provincial civil and identity registry office. Opened yesterday, the office will now deliver proper identity documents including registering births and deaths in the province. Acting Registrar General Noel Mobiha told MTV News the opening of the office paves way for an effective system to register all citizens in the province. He also said the office will now make processes for obtaining a national identity card easier. Officially opened by National Planning Minister Richard Maru and other leaders of the province, the WIWAC Civil and Identity Registry Office will act as a regional office for East and West Sipik. Online Labuslo. Lumi Nuku, I got up some law, Wara la Edwaki, all sa come down, all come down, all come down la year law, working business blow. So, in terms of this law office here, significant blow and law, role law, collecting civil and uh, civil and identification data and big platro. Acting Registrar General Noel Mobia says the office will assist in registering all citizens in the province with mobile registry offices to issue NID cards once processed and printed in Port Mosby. Before the NID office come here, get one plus two plus mobile units companies. They work the working data collection, come most and register most 35,000 people or register in Penis. Uh, local say 17,000, me plus give NID card long. So this is the data, me plus the verify yet, but them number plus we work. Mr. Mobia says an effective way to register all citizens is to establish district civil registry offices. However, this requires support from district administrations. All members of parliament, open members, electorate members, all must come to the minister and look him sign him all the MOU. I uh, need the MOU to safeguard him this trip because I need the district to get legal funding too. Because all the district, I need to set him up district, he must get support team to the back side of the office of the in order to set him so this is the cost of the current. So we need him district to come in the front. Meanwhile, Intergovernment Relations Minister and WIWEC MP Kevin Isufu says the opening of the new office complements the government's policy for decentralizing powers to every provinces. I'm glad that uh, as a government we are actually uh, rolling out, bringing out all these important services to the people. Uh. Uh, I would like to see more of that in line with the decentralization policy uh, to bring all the functions that are now being held in Waigani to decentralize them to the provinces so that uh, you know you give access to people to uh, access to services uh, instead of them going to Port Mosby and uh, uh, making it difficult for rural population. Stanley Over Jr. National MTV News. Civil Aviation Minister Alfred Manasse says more rural rundown airstrips will be upgraded and opened for public use. More focus will be on airstrips in rural economic zone areas. Minister Manasse also encouraged local MPs to subsidize air freight rates to allow the movement of people. Minister Alfred Manasse says his ministry is focusing on upgrading rural airstrips like Balimo and Telefomin in Western Province and Karamui in Chimbu, where there are growing hubs of economic activities. He said this will encourage rural airstrip agencies like MAF to continue its flight to rural areas, bringing services to the people. Manasse said focus will also be on other rural airstrips where there is no road link. Some of them are perched high on hilltops uh, where it's very difficult. The terrains are difficult, very difficult to build roads. So probably we can't expect to build roads uh, connecting every uh, community in, in the country. So uh, those ones that we cannot be accessing by road, we need to 
uh, airstrips. PNG boasted well over 4,000 rural airstrips 20 years ago. About 400 are still up and running, but are not fully CASA compliant. Minister Manasse said the national government is very supportive of rehabilitating rural airstrips. Mr. Manasse also urged local MPs to subsidize air freight to build the confidence of airline operators and also allow movement of the country's rural population. And allow for them to move, to bring in services, for them to fly out, kids going to school, uh, medical supplies going in. So um, we, we, we are doing a lot of work and we will continue to do that. And Mr. Manasse said more airstrips need to be properly built and maintained, just like roads and infrastructure. The airstrips will be used during emergencies, such as disasters, to transport relief supplies and school and medical kits. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Here with National MTV News this Wednesday, we'll have more after these messages, including stories making headlines overseas. Welcome back to the news. Supporting technical and vocational schools will address the large number of school dropouts every year. This according to Morbe Governor Ginsen Sauno. He said with the increasing population, more TVET schools need to be set up in the Morbe province. Yeah, I now have an education reform committee. Morbe Governor Ginsen Saonu says supporting TVET schools will help achieve the zero dropout policy by training more skilled tradesmen and women. Mr. Saonu said the province's new education reform committee will look into addressing TVET schools' they are sworn needs. In. They will be given the terms of reference and from there they will come up with the, uh, with the idea as to how we can address this. Malahang Technical High School is one of the TVET schools in Morabe. Last month we spoke to the principal, Winston Taumba, who said the school lacked materials and resources for their trade classes. At the moment, uh, funding has always been a problem. Uh, we're not giving really uh, the, the training that uh, our students require because of the funding. And all Mr. This. Saonu said with the increased population, more TVET schools also need to be established in the Morabe province. He is prepared to liaise with the nine MPs in the province to establish more schools. I think we really have to put up some because population is increasing. We are talking big. Let's, we will definitely do something about it. Now I have MP Kennedy Wenge supports this call. Now, debate by staff long year. I'm back. Come up finish. Long year. Now, me to make a believe was a Narpla high school to technical high school to by Sarbona. Debate by staff is a school and just like Narpa school. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lane. Turning overseas now, Fiji's famously warm welcome got a bit too hot for Meghan Markle today. Glimmering clouds eager to catch a glimpse of the Duchess of Sussex at a market forced her security to whisk her away early. Thousands of excited Fijians lined the streets, even scaling buildings to see royalty in the capital, Suva. A duchess putting on a brave face. Suva's market crowd far too boisterous, far too excited. And way too close for comfort. Bula, Fiji, Fiji, bula. The high spirits too much for Kensington Palace security, calling off the solo visit after just six minutes. A rare event in itself in the carefully planned world of royal meet and greets. Her husband enjoying a far more tranquil time half an hour away, applauding Fiji's efforts in sustainability and conservation at the solo Isuva rainforest. Local students proudly showing off their environmentally themed artwork, the school's top speechmaker putting her skills to the test in a talk she'll never forget. He said it was lovely and wonderful. It is a really great day. She made me she's proud of seeing the speech. Forest preservation, a key theme of the visit, one close to the Duke's heart. It's the second time on this tour that Prince Harry's shown support for his grandmother's canopy conservation project, also unveiling a plaque last week on Fraser Island in Australia. He met an 87-year-old woman who served tea to the Queen on her 1953 visit before a heartfelt message to the whole of Fiji. This delicately balanced ecosystem serves you so well. 
and there is an obligation to protect it. Earlier in the day, the Duke and Duchess stepped out together at the University of the South Pacific. The Duchess speaking of empowering women through education. And for women and girls in developing countries, this is vital. Providing them with access to education is the key to economic and social development. Earlier, the Duke also acknowledged Fiji's support in battle. A day of shared bonds and maybe just a little too much goodwill, all done and dusted. Rest time now for the Rockstar Royals. You're with National MTV News this Wednesday. We go for a break. When we come back, we we'll take a look at some sporting updates in Trukai Sports. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. To begin with, Rugby League Edwin Ipape and Brendan Nima have been named in the PNG LNG Kumul starting lineup to take on the England Knights. Both players were selected from the PNG Under 23 residence team. Brendan Nima will start on the wing and will debut in the number five jersey, while Edwin Ipape will play a pivotal role starting in the 5'8 position. Ipape played a major part in the PNG Under-23 residence win over the New South Wales country team two weeks ago, scoring a try and assisting in a few more. And they go wide, Ipape, he runs at the line. Fellow debutants Dilbert Isaac and Zev John will come off the interchange bench. David Mead will captain the side and take his place in the fullback position, with Junior Rao making a comeback to representative football, starting on the right wing. Justin Olam and Nene McDonald have been named in the centres, with Watson Boas at halfback. Tom Butterfield will start as hooker, while Moses Meninga and Nixon Poot will play in the second row. Enoch Maki, Stenton and Wellington Albert will lead the charge up front. Ase Boas and Redley Brower have also been named on the bench. The team travel to late today and will prepare for their match on Saturday. Elijah Lavette, National MTV Sports. Still on Rugby League, Vitis Central Dabari presented their bid documents to the PNG NRLC in their quest to be a part of the Intercity Cup competition next year. The bid was presented to PNG NRLC manager Stanley Hondina in Port Mosby. Fee or endorsement fee of 100000 to... Bid chairman Keith Iduhu and his team presented the bid documents to the PNG National Rugby League competition in their pursuit of entering a central team into the Intercity Cup competition. It's been months since the bid campaign began and they have since secured sponsorship from VT's Industries and have travelled the central province to make their bid known. The bid document. The handover of the bid is the beginning of another journey as they wait in anticipation to hear the outcome from the PNG NRLC board. We can only do so much. We can only tick so many boxes. And after all is said and done, it will come back to the, the board that will make, may, uh, give the consideration. And it's our hope. Iduhu says the bid comes in three aspects in terms of sponsorship and hopes to receive a favorable outcome in the coming weeks. So we will come up with the, with the opportunity to avail you an opportunity to say yes or no to three prong, a three-prong approach. And the branding for, for, for our intended purposes is threefold. We give you the opportunity to consider Vitis Industries. We also give you the opportunity to consider Fortuna Online. And if you don't like that, we are hopeful that you can consider Fortuna Pharmaceuticals as our branding as we go into the 2019 season. Having a team in the Intercity Cup competition is an expensive exercise, with almost 6 million kina used to run the tournament every year. VT's managing director Vicky Mossin assured the PNG NRLC that they are financially secured, and if the team is considered, VT's might even join the Intercity Cup group of sponsors. I hope this bid will come through you and you will give us your favorable response. And we are ready to take the undertaking for two percent. You might consider me as a sub sponsor when we come on board. <laughs> Over the years, three or more bids have come from the central province, but they were all rejected. 
This is the first time only one bid has come from Central. But we've had three or four bids from Central every time. So when it gets into the board meeting, my board tells them, go and settle yourselves. There's one province, we should have one team, so go and fix yourselves. Go talk amongst yourselves. Organize yourselves and I'm, I'm happy that now we can at least get one bid from Central Province. Upon receiving the bid documents and nomination fee of 100,000 kina, PNG NRLC manager Stanley Hondina made known that there are 14 bids that have been submitted and only two will be considered to join the competition next year. I'll be in touch after we take this document back and uh, collect the others that will come through. At the moment, the 14 have some interest and we have only space for two. So it's a tough one, but we'll, we'll let you know on the outcome as and when, when we meet. Bids for teams vying to enter the PNG NRL competition close on Friday. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. To horse racing now with 24 horses set to race in this year's Melbourne Cup. Director of Pacific Racing, Peter McCoy, says with the race expected to see some of the best horses and jockeys, betting will also come in different ranges. Pacific Racing manager Tom McCoy encouraged punters to not only enjoy and celebrate the Melbourne Cup, but to gamble responsibly. The 2018 Melbourne Cup will take place on the 6th of November, where 2017 champion Rick Kindling will be looking to keep its 2017 title. Anyone that's interested in the Melbourne Cup, they should be coming and start following their horses and work out what they think can win the Melbourne Cup. Uh, this is this is the way to start here. It's uh, it's got the best of the horses and the best of the riders uh, are engaged in this, and the betting's very wide betting rates. So you know it's hard to pick the winner, but uh, like the Melbourne Cup again, it'll be going to be a wide betting race. Um, if you do, you'll, uh, you'll uh, get uh, big odds. The trifectas usually pay a lot. Not about um, coming in to pick the winner, it's about coming in to have some fun, gamble responsibly, um, it's a wide field, there are a lot of prospects that can win and they'll pay good odds and um, just come and enjoy the, the atmosphere and, and socialise. Don't go anywhere, we'll have more of Trukai Sports after these messages. Trukai Sports Welcome back to Trukai Sports to Boxing now. Kiwi boxing promoter Dean Lonergan is dismissing a stinging attack from Aussie boxer Anthony Mandine. Mandine's labelled the New Zealander despicable in the build-up to his fight against Aussie Jeff Horn in Brisbane next month. A war of words to build up to a fight with fists isn't exactly a new concept in boxing, but Anthony Mundine's latest outburst is taking traditional pre-bout banter to a new level. The writing has got nothing to do with it. You know, he's, piece of, he's a piece of S-H-I-T to me. That was directed at Kiwi promoter Dean Lonigan, who works with Mundine's upcoming opponent, fellow Aussie Jeff Horn. Look, this is a boxing game, so I'm not too concerned about it. I guess the thing that he is, um, he's reacted so strongly is the fact that we're getting under his skin. Mundine was responding to what he perceived as a personal slight. He returned to Sydney early from a training camp in Florida. Lonergan called it a psychological win for the Horn camp after accusing the former NRL star of not doing enough to promote the November bout. I threatened him with legal action if they didn't come back, and voila, here he is three days later. So you've got to say who won that battle. Mundine calling Lonergan despicable and says he wishes it was the Kiwi taking the punches, not Horn. I do feel disrespected. I feel sorry for Jeff. He's the one that's going to cop the hits. I'm going to cut him up. Jeff Horn was meant to have a media session here in Sydney today, but it's been cancelled. Lonergan telling One News he wants to get on with training. But the side shows are far from over. In the All Aussie bout, Mundine's had his say on the national anthem as well. I mean, they play that anthem, I'm sitting down, man. I can't stand for that. It's, what, it's a white supremacist song. A stance sure to spark more controversy in a sport that thrives on it. To cricket now, and Mitchell McLennigan signalled his limited overs intentions to the black cap selectors. The left arm bowler is now playing domestic cricket after giving up on his freelance T20 career as he pushes to make another World Cup. Today, he made an instant impact for Auckland. Sending a statement in his first game back in New Zealand. 
Mitchell McLennigan on his way to a four-wicket haul against Northern Districts in the domestic one-day competition. The first step in a push to getting back in black. I'm going to be here, I'm going to work my ass off and, and try and push these boys all the way to the World Cup because you know, I really have missed 50, 50 over game. That World Cup, the big carrot. Just a year after turning his back on an NZC contract to pursue a career as a T20 specialist. I'm under no illusion. I, I think it's probably a very, very slim chance in terms of um, you know, where, where I probably am at the, at the minute. Um, but hey, that's always been the way I've played cricket. Always you know, back up against the wall and, and, and really come out and fight real hard. McLennigan's played 48 ODIs for New Zealand, the last of which was back in 2016, taking 82 wickets. Now hoping a change in national coach could put him under close watch. I think it will. Um, I think, you know, clean slate um, is always uh, a good place to start. We are blessed at the moment in New Zealand cricket with a number of really quality pace bowling options and I think it's probably the, the one area that's, that's possibly the hardest to select right now. At least one player hoping to make it even harder to select as he fights to wear black again. And that's it for Trukai Sports. We go for a break now. When we come back, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Sports. <laughs> Trukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region, a shower or two in Daru and Kerma, fine weather expected in Port Mosby, Alotau and Popandeta. To the Mumasa region, thundery rain expected in Wau, Medang, Wibak and Vanimo. Thundery rain as well in Lei. To the New Guinea Islands region, showers expected in Buka. Thundery rain expected in Kimbe, Kokopo, Rambaul, Kaveng and Lorangau. And in the Highlands region, all the major centres, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabe can expect showers over the next 24 hours. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's the new sport and weather for today, Wednesday the 24th of October 2018. On behalf of the MTV News team right around the country, pleasant viewing, good night. <laughs>